Hey there everyone, welcome back to part 4 of this Blender Cookie tutorial series on working with advanced shader nodes in Cycles. Uh, in the start of this uh, part, we are basically just going to be going through and doing some cleanup work on the Uber shader that we more or less completed at the end of part 3. We're really just going to be going through here, um, creating sane min-max values for all of the inputs that we have. Uh, and then framing things up in a way that makes it clear what everything's doing. I'm not going to go through and do each and every one of these on camera, uh, just because it would be monotonous and repetitive. Um, for the vast majority of these, we're going to just be doing uh, 0 to 1 as the uh, min-max values. But for anything where we're doing something other than that, I will uh, stop or I will start recording again and uh, explain what's going on. Uh, so for now, I'm going to pause and uh, I'll be back in just a moment. All right, here we have um, subsurface scattering scale. The default that it's gone to here is zero to a million. Uh, I doubt you'll ever have to go as high as a million. It's probably good to leave a relatively high number in here, though. Uh, I'm going to go to a thousand. Um, I can't imagine working in a scene much larger than that, and uh, personally I like to always work in real scale, so uh, one meter equals one meter, or one blender unit equals one meter. Um, so you really shouldn't have to go much larger than that, uh, you know, the vast majority of the time. Here we have uh, anisotropy, and uh, now this isn't to use anisotropy, this is to control the amount of anisotropy. Um, it currently goes from negative one to one. Uh, I've never seen a negative anisotropy value that returned a visually pleasing result. Uh, I guess maybe there could be a time when you would want to use it, but I would set this from zero to one. Uh, here we have index of refraction for the uh, refractive and glass materials. Um, currently it goes from one to 1,000. Uh, in practice, there uh, is nothing that really goes above an index of refraction of about 4. Um, you might want to set this to, say, 10 to give a little more wiggle room, uh, but you definitely don't need to be a 1,000. Here we have transmittance depth, which currently is negative infinity to positive infinity. Uh, we definitely don't want the minimum to be negative infinity. We're going to have that be 0. Uh, the maximum really depends on the scale that you're working at, uh, you'll probably never need to go above, say, 10,000 or so, and that would be maybe for a huge ocean scene. Um, so we're going to leave that at uh, 0 to 10,000 and move on. Uh, here we have use fake uh, shadow. Currently it's negative uh, 10,000 to 10,000. We just want that to be from 0 to 1. Here we have emission strength. Uh, right now it is 0 to a million. Um, really this is as bright as, uh, this is going to rely on how bright you need your lights to be, so I would leave the max as large a number as you can. A million is good. You probably aren't ever going to have a light brighter than that. Uh, here we have used mat. Currently it's negative 10,000 to 10,000. We're going to, again, set that from 0 to 1, just because it's a switch. And finally at the bottom here we have the mat alpha. Again, this is just going to be 0 to 1. Um, anything I didn't explicitly cover in there is going to be a 0 to 1 value as well. Um, again, if you didn't catch at the beginning how to change those, it is in the interface panel, just minimum and maximum. Uh, now we can go in and start um, kind of framing these all up uh, to make sense of what's going on. Uh, so within uh, node groups here, you can select a few nodes. So I'm going to select the diffuse and the uh, Combined Diffuse Holdout node, and press Control J. Um, and that will kind of frame everything up up here. Uh, it's also going to frame up this holdout as well. Within a frame, you can label your frame. So I'm going to call this Diffuse. Um, and you can also give custom colors to help keep things organized. I'm going to make this one kind of a blue. So we're going to drag that up here, just to uh, keep everything looking good. Um, we're going to go through and do this for everything. So we're going to grab these three, Control J, move them over a little bit. This is going to be subsurface. Uh, 
Uh, and again, custom color, and we're going to give this a, let's make this red. So I'm going to go ahead and go through, do this for each thing, and then we will come back uh, after I'm done, and I will go through and uh, show how I've organized everything. Uh, I've just uh, noticed an error here in uh, the shader stack. Um, here we have this uh, subsurface. We have a second node called diffuse holdout. Um, and this here, we want to get rid of that and we want to put in an uh, add shader. So we're going to grab the add shader and we're going to add the subsurface scattering rather than mix it in. There we go. And I'm going to continue framing everything up and uh, I will start again if there are any more errors that I notice. All right, we've got uh, everything organized here. Uh, I'm going to do a quick run through and just kind of show what everything does now. Um, as you can see, we've got everything color coded and uh, sectioned off into individual areas. Start up here at the top and work our way down. Uh, we've got our diffuse, which has uh, all the nodes relating to the diffuse component. It's also got our holdout component that we use a number of times in here. Um, as you can see, we've got our diffuse, we've got our diffuse holdout. Then we move down to our subsurface. We've got our subsurface node. Um, we've got our uh, mix shader. I'm actually going to rename that really quickly. Uh, this is going to be our SSS holdout. Uh, and here we have the node where we add subsurface scattering to the mix. We move down to glossy. We've got our glossy. We've got our anisotropic. We've got where we uh, switch between our glossy and anisotropic. We have our mix between our glossy and our holdout. That's our weighting. And we have where we add glossy to the stack. Uh, over here to the left, We've got our for now. Uh, we've got everything collapsed down, but this would allow you to switch between uh, facing and for now if you wanted to. I just have that off to the side so it's easier to find and switch if you need to. Move on down to refraction and glass. We've got our refraction with transmission. We have our glass with transmission. We have our switch. We've got our weight. And we've got our addition to the stack. Move down to fake shadow. We've got our geometry and dot product where we get our fake caustics. We've got our caustic switch here in the multiply node. We've got our transparent. And here we've got where fake shadow is added to the stack along with the uh, factor for that. Here we have emission. It's uh, just the emission shader and the uh, emission mix node. Move down to the matte shader where we have our emission and our transparent uh, and the nodes necessary to switch between our, or to switch our matte alpha on and off. Uh, here is where matte is mixed into the stack. And finally, we have our opacity, uh, which is just transparent and mix shader. And that all just goes right to the group output. As you can see, everything's nicely organized. It's easy to see what every single node does. Uh, and uh, we went ahead earlier and gave everything a sane value. So this is a complete Uber shader, uh, ready to be used in production. Um, you can hand this off to an artist, and, or you can use this yourself if you are a freelancer, and uh, it is all set, good to go. Now we're going to hop into a little scene I've prepared. Okay, here we are in the little scene I've prepared to uh, work with the Uber Shader. Uh, as you can see, it's very simple. It's just a couple of chairs, a table, uh, a wine carafe, and a couple of wine glasses. Um, I grabbed most of these models from BlendSwap.com just for uh, the ease of setting up a simple scene. Uh, all I've done is add the uh, tablecloth to the scene, rather. Um, so for the next few minutes, it's going to be on time lapse as I go through and uh, just get everything set up with materials. Uh, and then afterwards, I will run through quickly and kind of uh, show off what everything does in the materials themselves. Um, and then after that, I'm going to jump over to another layer where I have some uh, objects with different materials, common materials you might need. Uh, prepared and I will be showing off uh, the parameters for those as well.
All right, here we are. Uh, I got a render result that I'm happy with. Uh, obviously, it's not super professional quality or anything, uh, but it is just a very quick scene and uh, just a very quick example of how to set up materials using the Uber shader. Um, there were a couple of uh, crashes when I tried to render while I was going through, uh, and uh, that's just because I'm using um, a MinGW build of Blender, uh, and it's not quite as stable as the official builds. Yeah, you might have noticed a couple jumps while uh, if you watch through the time lapse, but it shouldn't really matter because now we're just going to go through, um, and I'm going to show each material and what it does um, here. I'm going to hop into the node editor. Uh, in the video, you might have noticed that I worked um, quite a bit in the node editor. That's just what I'm more comfortable with. Uh, most of what I did could be done just from here in the properties panel. Uh, so if I hop over to my chair, um, things like this, this RGB to black and white and the bump, you'd probably have to jump into the node editor to do, and uh, again, to use the hue saturation value. Um, but as far as just adding textures and stuff, that's very easily done from the properties panel. Uh, for example, you would just uh, hop into diffuse color, uh, go to image texture, and pick your texture. Uh, so we're going to run through here. This is the wood material. Uh, it's relatively simple. It's just a diffuse weight of one with a wood texture. Um, and a glossy weight of about two I found works very well. High roughness uh, and uh, pretty high for an L coefficient as well. Um, that's really all there is to that material. The glass material, as I believe I showed when I was creating the material itself, is full glossy weight, very low glossy roughness, a phenyl coefficient of about 0.35 matches glass almost perfectly. Full transparency, uh, I matched the roughness to the glossy roughness, Index of refraction of about 1.55, which is standard for glass. Uh, I didn't use any transmittance color in this glass, so I have them set the same, and I have the transmittance depth set to zero. I have the used glass turned off because I wanted to use the decoupled version. Fake shadow is turned on, and fake caustics are at about 0.6. Uh, there are no really strong or small light sources in this scene, so there's not much in the way of caustics, but it does add just a little bit. So I used that for both wine glasses and the carafe. Here we have the wine object itself, um, more or less the same as the glass, the only things that are different are I turned the uh, transparency down a little bit just because wine is a bit thicker liquid than water, or than glass rather, meaning it's, it's not quite as transparent as glasses. There are things suspended in the wine, um, mainly the remains of the grapes, that make light act a little bit differently than glass, so I turned the transparency down a bit. Uh, I turned the roughness of just the wine up a little bit to, again, help with that scattering. The measured index of perfection of red wine is 1.339. Uh, so I went ahead and used that there. I did use transmittance color here. A um, little bit darker color in the middle of the wine as opposed to at the edges. I have the transmittance depth at about 1.5. Uh, turned fake shadow. Oh, I do not have fake shadow on. So I'll go ahead and turn that on. Um, and the fake shadow is just the same as the uh, refraction base color. Here we have the tablecloth. Very simple. It's just diffuse with a little bit of roughness and a checker texture plugged in uh, using the UVs as the vector input. Let me hop into UV image editor. Go to my render result and you can kind of see that. Yeah. Still a little bit of noise, um, which would have needed a few more uh, either glossy or transmission samples to clear up, but at full size, um, it's not really that visible. And again, not going for super professional uh, render quality here, um, just trying to show off the Uber material. Let's take a look at the ground. The ground is just a rock material that I've repeated a few times. Uh, it's just from, or uh, the texture is from cgtextures.com, uh, and it will be included with this file. The diffuse weight is one. High diffuse roughness because it is stone, uh, and it's scattering light quite a bit. A little bit of glossy weight for uh, glancing angles, that's why we have this um, kind of middle area for an L coefficient. 
in there, we also have grout. You can't really see it, but it is just a concrete texture. Um, again, just using the RGB to black and white and using that as the bump map. A um, little bit lower roughness, uh, no glossy at all, just because it's not that big a part of the scene. So that's the materials for this scene as they're set up now. Nothing super fancy, but uh, this definitely does speed up the material work for things such as this glass uh, and the wine. Um, and anything where you need to mix a glossy and a diffuse material by a Fresnel, uh, this is a much faster way to be able to set that up. Uh, I didn't really get into anything like matte materials or emission in here, um, but again, they're pretty self-explanatory, very easy to set up. Uh, I'm going to hop over to another layer here where I have a few materials set up. Um, common materials that uh, you might find yourself trying to use. Um, so these are going to be included in the blend file as well, um, and we will just very quickly take a look at their parameters. So I'm going to go ahead and turn on my render view. First one we have is a brushed metal shader. Uh, this is using, oh, don't want to move it. This is using just a uh, flat metal texture, again from cgtextures.com. A little bit of diffuse weight, mostly glossy weight. Uh, and anisotropy is turned on to get these stretched highlights. Ideally, I would have used a bump map as well, uh, but for the sake of just this, it's really not that. You can see the effect even without it. So let's move over. Here I have a basic car paint shader. Basically, this is just full diffuse and full glossy weight mixed by a Fresnel coefficient, a little bit of roughness to the uh, gloss layer. If you wanted to, you could mix this with another Uber shader uh, to get the effect of metallic flake under the, under the top coat. Uh, but uh, this is a good place to start, and if you have an object that's a little bit further away, this is perfectly fine to use as a uh, car paint shader. Moving along, we have water. Water has no diffuse weight, has a glossy weight of 1, for an L coefficient again of about 0.35. No anisotropy, full refraction transparency, and here I have a uh, white color for the base color and a little bit of a blue color for the transmittance color. I have a depth of about 2.5, and the index of refraction of water uh, or uh, potable water. Uh, that is anything that's out of like a, a river or a lake. Um, it's about 1.33 if it's clean. Tiny bit of roughness. And I have fake shadow turned on even though it's not casting a shadow on anything. But uh, that is a good place to start for a water shader. Moving along, we have a wax material. This has no diffuse weight, one subsurface scattering weight. Uh, scale of 1, and if you take a look over here, you can see that my radii are about 0.8 for red, 0.75 for green, and 0.3 for blue. Uh, and I find that this gives a pretty good wax fall off for light. Um, I gave this uh, material and the water material a little bit of bump just to make them more interesting to look at. Uh, I also have a glossy weight of 1 with a glossy roughness of 0.35 and a Fresnel coefficient of 0.35 as well. I just find that this works really well as a wax material. Moving along, we have a glazed ceramic material. Uh, this is similar to the car paint material. It's diffuse weight of one, glossy weight of one. Diffuse uh, has a little bit of roughness to it. Glossy has a very low roughness to it. Fresnel coefficient of about 0.3. Um, moving on to the last one that we have. This is a plaster material. Uh, it can also be used just for common uh, wall paint or something like that. Um, uh, I have a noise material just to break up the surface a little bit. Diffuse weight of 1. Uh, glossy weight of about 0.2, but a very high glossy roughness. Uh, and if I rotate around, you can kind of see how that works. Um, uh, but uh, again, very good for just uh, walls. You can color it with the diffuse color. Uh, say if you were doing kind of a dark red wall. Uh, works very well just as uh, painted walls for an interior. So those are the materials that are included with this. These are just on the layer right uh, below the first layer. 
Uh, so you can take a look at those if you want. This concludes this four-part tutorial on the basics of the Uber shader. I found the shader to be very helpful in a professional pipeline. Uh, it definitely cuts down on look development and it can cut down on shader development as well. Uh, not having to have a whole bunch of different uh, shaders in here makes it much easier to look at, I think. And uh, for some artists who don't like the node editor, having everything in the properties panel is a great way to make it a little bit more approachable for someone who's not ready to jump into the nodes. In the broader sense, I hope this tutorial series has also kind of shown how to craft a node system that works to your needs. Um, I know nodes can be a little bit scary to look at at first, but uh, as you can see, after you know what everything does and uh, with the organization options available in the node editor, um, it really doesn't have to be that much of a big deal to construct something like this. You can set up an entire library like this of materials that you use regularly. Um, and rather than having to create something new or struggle with the node system to try and create a material, you can just have a backup library of things like the Uber shader or any number of materials that you use regularly. So this concludes the tutorial series uh, and I will see you next time.